All right, forbidden topics, lesson that'll get you criticized, called out, or canceled. This is lesson number four in that series, dealing with addiction, part two. And uh, today um, we're going to talk about uh, the Bible and uh, the Bible and addiction, partly. We're going to talk about that a little later on. Let's uh, review what we've talked about so far, very quickly. There are substances called drugs, which are categorized this way for a reason. All drugs, all drugs have an effect on you to a degree or another. Aspirin, you say, well, it's just an aspirin. Well, aspirin has an effect on you to a degree or another. Illicit drugs, however, uh, they speed you up and they make you think you are stronger, faster, smarter. <coughs> they, uh, or other types of illicit drugs, slow you down. And they make everything feel that you're in control, it's pleasant, you're relaxed. Or other types of drugs change your perception of reality or time or self-awareness. Uh, and all of these kind of go sideways, you know, your self-awareness, your time, you know, certain drugs really change your perception. Now we said that regardless of the drug, they all have two things in common. First of all, if you take them into your body, you will pay a price. And again, I'm talking about illegal drugs. You'll pay a price. And it's usually a negative price. And I showed you a couple of MRI scans of brains last week, you know, one the normal brain, no illicit drug, and then one the brain of an addict, and you just visually saw the difference uh, between the two. So if you take illicit drugs, uh, you're going to pay a price. Some medications help solve problems if you take them correctly. Uh, but there are always side effects, right? I mean, I look out there and you, you take, you know, we all take one medication or another for something to control our blood pressure or, you know, diabetes, all these types of drugs, the ones that are legal uh, are helpful, but they, they still have side effects that are unpleasant at times. So you can imagine drugs that are illegal. You're not allowed to take these drugs. For sure you're going to have a negative uh, side effects. So all recreational drugs have long-term negative effects on you. I think in this uh, audience, uh, it's not too hard to uh, convince, but uh, it's not always easy to convince a younger audience that a long-term uh, consumption of illegal drugs will absolutely have an effect on you. And uh, you don't have a lot of believers in the crowd when you say that. Also drugs are addictive, that's the other thing. Drugs are addictive, that's why they are drugs, that's why they are usually controlled or outlawed because they have a very strong uh, addictive uh, component. So in addition, an addiction rather, is when, you need, uh, when your need for the drug is greater than your ability to say no to it, then you're addicted. When you're addicted, you have a brain disease, and we talked about that last week. Addiction is a brain disease. Remember I said, yes, it's a sin at the beginning, but eventually it, that sin leads you to uh, brain damage. So in this session, we're going to uh, talk more about addictions in general, and also we're going to see what does the Bible teach on this particular uh, subject. So the dictionary defines addiction as a strong habit, uh, but it doesn't explain how that habit actually starts and how it grows. So there are two groups of addictions. One is substance addiction. This is where the thing that you put into your body has an addictive ingredient that gets you hooked. Again, we talked about that last week, right? The steps of becoming addicted. First, you learn the mood swing. Number two, you begin seeking the mood swing. 
Number three, you become dependent on the mood swing. And then number four, you're addicted. No longer a mood swing to euphoria. When you're addicted, the mood swing is to pain. And you need to take the drug in order to stop the pain. Very bad situation. Uh, so, so substance addictions. Then there are psychological uh, addictions. Uh, these are just as strong, uh, however, they are more complicated to understand. In a psychological addiction, there is something about you. In other words, there's something about the way that you're wired or put together or the way that you think, or perhaps uh, because of the experiences that you've had. Nevertheless, there's just something about you that make ordinary things addictive for you. For example, cigarettes have nicotine and anybody who smokes or chews tobacco, uh, you know, eventually becomes addicted. Why? Because the substance itself has an addiction. You know, it's a no brainer. But for some people, certain type of things that are in themselves harmless become addictive to them. Food, for example, is not addictive. There's no ingredient in food that is necessarily in, uh, addictive. But for some people, because of the way that they are, food becomes addictive for them. They either can't stop eating or they can't make themselves or, or the opposite, they can't make themselves eat, you know, one or the other. Within psychological addictions, uh, there are all kinds of things that people can be addicted to. Uh, the big one nowadays, video games. That's one of the big addictions nowadays, is video game. People become addicted to those things. TV, certain kinds of people. People are addicted to certain kinds of people. They tend to seek out certain types of people to befriend, to cling to. Um, shopping addiction. We won't talk about that, okay, here. We'll just move on. <laughs> shopping addiction. Um, I mentioned food addiction. Uh, hoarding things. People who hoard things. They, it's, an, it's an addictive um, issue with them. Uh, sexual images, they become addicted. What's the cause of these things? A lot of reasons why people become addicted psychologically or uh, to substances. Let's, uh, let's talk about substance addictions first. Why, you know, why do people become addicted to these things? Well, curiosity is usually the first step. They want to see what it's like. I remember one argument when I was younger, you know, someone, it wasn't to me, but they were trying to talk to someone else, you know, get them, uh, get them uh, to try, I forget what it was, but to try uh, some illegal drug. And they were saying, look, do you want to grow up and grow old and have to say to your children, I never tried crack, heroin, <laughs> I mean, that was the argument. And usually it's the, the curiosity argument is, uh, there's a little um, booster to that argument. It's uh, uh, just try it and just try it this one time. That's all. What could go wrong? What could possibly happen? You try, nobody gets addicted, you know, trying something just once. Oh yes, they do. <laughs> oh yes, they do. Certain types of people, one hit of cocaine is all that it takes and they're addicted for life. I know this because uh, my, uh, uh, my brother-in-law is uh, actually my cousin, right? My brother-in-law's son is like this. I mean, when he was 17, he, he went to a private school now you think you go to a private school, no danger, but he went to a private school and someone made him try cocaine. One time he tried it, 
He's 52 years old now. He's never held a job. He's always lived in halfway homes. He's been a, his whole life from that one moment, that one time he tried it when he was 17 years old. I remember that. So curiosity, peer pressure. People try uh, illegal substances because they want to fit in. They want to be part of the group. They don't want people to think that, well, they're not cool or whatever. They just don't want people to think that they're afraid or that they can't handle it. I mean, there's a hundred different, hundred different uh, reasons, but peer pressure. Very rarely does someone just sit at home by themselves and say, you know what, I think I'm going to call out and see if I can find myself a, you know, some heroin, because I'd like to try that tonight here by myself. No. No, it's at a party and, uh, and, the, and the music is loud and things are happening and there are nice girls and uh, this and that. And there's one guy and he's like one of the coolest guys that is there because everybody seems to gravitate towards that guy. And the reason that everybody's gravitating towards that guy is because that guy's got the drugs. <laughs> It's always the guy with the drugs that's very, very popular. And so everybody is, you know, everybody there is, is trying. That's a form of peer pressure. So you want to try too, especially if you're a younger guy or girl, you don't want to be left out. Um, ignorance and immaturity. Young people, and this is for pretty much you know, all things, they don't believe the danger involved. They don't believe it's that dangerous driving 95 miles an hour in your car. They don't think it's that dangerous or going down a steep hill on their bike. You know, they don't think that's dangerous and taking drugs. They don't see that as being dangerous. Ignorance. And then there's depression, unhappiness for some reason or other makes them try drugs to ease the pain of loneliness or the pain of being an outsider, not fitting in somehow, or the pain of feeling awkward or the pain of you know, all kinds of psychological pain that people feel that they think that they can uh, resolve uh, by taking drugs. And many times for a short period of time, uh, they fit in. Remember the party we were all at five minutes ago, I was telling you about and the music's loud and everybody's dancing, having a good time. And there's a popular guy and, and he's got little, little packets, you know, and it's a pill or a powder or whatever. And you, and he said, yeah, if I put the beer aside, beer's for kids, you know, that's just, that's for, that's for punks. Try some real good stuff, try this. And people are trying it, whoa, it's really good, never had anything so good, you know, whatever. And that guy or that girl who's depressed, who feels she doesn't fit in, he doesn't fit in, he says, yeah, maybe I'm going to try that. And then for an hour or two that night, Wow, wow, I fit in, I'm part of the gang, I'm feeling good, sure, I'll dance, I'll get out there, make a fool of myself. <laughs> Today we call it self-medication, and it is what it is, it, it's true, it's basically what it is. Never, never mind what kind of drug or substance or many people take these things to self-medicate, to lower the pain that they have for whatever reason. So those are some of the causes of uh, substance addictions. Then psychological addictions. Self-image, of course, we don't see ourselves as we really are, or we're angry. A lot of angry feelings make us hurt ourselves. Many angry and frustrated people, for example, use pornography as an outlet. I know it's hard to see the connection, but it's amazing. Uh, 
many angry uh, and depressed people uh, cut themselves, cutting. Mostly girls, very rare that, that men do this, but girls do that a lot, young women do that. Cutting or burning, burning themselves. You know, if you're a happy-go-lucky, everything is going great in your life, like for real, you know, got good grades, nice family at home, whatever, you know, and you like yourself and whatever, it's not something you're going to do. It's because you're, you're angry or it's because you're hurt or because you have perhaps low self-esteem. We don't like ourselves, so we lock into addictive behavior to temporarily uh, remove the pain, remember it's all about pain, to remove the pain of low self-esteem. So many of you, hopefully all of you, come from families where your father, your mother told you you're a good son and I, I, I'm looking forward to great things from you. And, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate that you're making an effort and so on and so forth. Hopefully all people here come from those kind of homes. But there are many people who come from homes where the opposite happens, where the father is telling you, you know what, you're a useless, you're a punk. You know, I don't know, you, know, you, don't, you never do anything. You never get anywhere. Why can't you be like your brother? Why can't you be like your sister? You know, a lot of people come from those kind of families. And it's very, very, very hurtful to be treated like that as a child and grow up with that. Uh, fixations, we fixate. Uh, hero worship, you know, uh, on a person or a thing and get into a repetition mode of behavior. All kinds of fixations that people can have. And of course, there are many other, you know, when I talk about fixation, I'll give you an example, but you, you got to be of a certain uh, age to, uh, how, how many people remember Twiggy? Oh, just a few, huh? Twiggy. Twiggy was a model in the 60s, right? I think it's in the 60s, you know, the British invasion, the Beatles, blah, blah, blah. She was part of that. She was a model. She weighed 90 pounds. Seriously, she weighed 90 pounds. Uh, a pretty, if I remember, a pretty girl, you know, pretty face and she had a little pixie cut, you know, and, but I mean, phew, she looked like a boy, you know, basically. Two, her legs like two poles and two sticks for arms. I mean, she was just, you know, you'd say, if you were a mom, you'd say, get that girl in here and put some food into her. You know, she needs to, you know, we, we need to put a little bit of beef on you, girl. You know? She was like that, but she became an international superstar model. She was a model. And I mean, you couldn't pick up a newspaper, a magazine or something. Uh, it was Twiggy, it was Twiggy all the time. You know, there, there was a time it was Paris Hilton and now we have the Kardashians. Well, back in the sixties, it was Twiggy. And so many girls fixated on Twiggy and they wanted to be like Twiggy and they would buy the clothes that, you know, that she wore. The problem, however, is that not all girls, uh, well, I don't mean like a nine or a 10 year old girl. I mean, not all 19, 20 year old girls weigh 87 pounds. <laughs> so you have these girls that normally, just their normal weight, you know, five foot eight, maybe 120 pounds or something like that, you know, 130 pounds, trying to fit themselves into clothing designed for somebody that weighs 88, 90 pounds. It didn't work well. We had never heard of bulimia before Twiggy. We'd never heard of the eating disorders before Twiggy. Nobody knew what that was. You mean, wait a minute, you eat and then you make yourself throw up? So what? Or you don't eat at all, why? Because I, I, I want to wear the, those jeans that Twiggy, she's a size minus two. <laughs> and your normal size is a 10. 
you, you've got a long way to go, girl. Well, these girls developed a psychological addiction to thinness. It had everybody stumped. You know, nobody knew what to do. So last week I talked about you know, the steps to addiction and talk a little bit more about that tonight in general. There are many different addictions, but the way to become addicted is similar. I showed you the psychological process. Now this week, we're going to talk about the personal process. The personal process is step one is ingestion. We take into our bodies or our minds a substance that has an addictive property. We eat it, we see it with our eyes, like Porn is an obvious one, but you know, the eating thing there, I want to be 98 pounds, uh, that was, we saw her with our eyes and some girls you know, fixated on that and said, that's what I want, that's what I'm missing. Or we smoke it, or we, we, we pick up the emotional habit. Any way you do it, an, addif an addictive thing or idea or fixation gets into you. That's step one. Step two is infatuation. Once it's inside, like a virus, it begins to send a signal to your brain. And the signal is, repeat the process because this feels good and this works for me and this solves the problem, whatever the problem is. The next step is infection. When we obey the demands of the substance to repeat the process of ingesting and continuing the habit and the repetition of it, it makes the virus send another message to the brain. And that message says, continue repeating because I need this and I must have this. Not, I want to do this again because this is fun. Now the third step, infection, I need to have this. And if I don't have this, it's going to hurt. And then the fourth step is imprisonment. When the addiction is firmly ingrained and you are ingesting, repeating, cutting, whatever you're doing, uh, the action as a habit then the virus sends its final message to the brain. Continue repeating because I cannot live without this. Whatever it is. I cannot live without this. So the goal of the addictive virus is to A, control you, B, dominate you, and then kill you. A little harsh, but true. It's the way it works. Control, dominate, kill. People have known this for a long time. This is why drugs and other things have been made you know, against the law or controlled by the law. Addictions can destroy people's lives. That's why people are careful with them and why you know, we're talking about these things tonight. And the thing about uh, substances is that they become stronger and stronger and stronger as time goes by. The strongest, you know, what they used to say or what they say today, you know, the marijuana, for example, that people smoked back in the 70s is nothing like the marijuana that people smoke today much more powerful, much more dangerous, and so on and so forth. And you could say that about all the categories of drugs. And they have new stuff out, new substances. I, some of these I'm not even familiar with myself, but new substances that just one hit and you're addicted, skip all the steps, you know, one, one hit and you're done. All right, so let's uh, talk about uh, the Bible. We said the Bible and addiction. As Christians, you know, we don't need the Bible 
to see the danger of addiction because there's plenty of scientific evidence to demonstrate the terrible consequences of addiction. We do, however, need to know um, uh, about the moral implications regarding the ingestion of those things that may lead to addiction, and the Bible does have something to say about this. Of course, the Bible doesn't specifically name you know, cigarettes or heroin or other modern addictive substances because these things change throughout history. But what remains the same is the problem of addiction. Human beings have become addicted to drugs or ideas or people from the moment Adam sinned. And so God's word has dealt with addiction, not just with the things people have become addicted to throughout history. Now the only drug that the Bible ever mentions is alcohol because it's the oldest. First time a drug problem is mentioned in the Bible is when Noah gets drunk after leaving the ark. Uh, I would imagine, think for a moment now, he's been on the ark pretty long time with his family. He's tired. If, if this guy's not depressed, I, I don't know who wouldn't be. And so he plants a, a vineyard and it says he got drunk and he slept naked in his cave, probably, you know, just too drunk to know what he was doing. And this led to his son mocking him and uh, created a problem in his family. And I think we're familiar enough with the, with the story, you know, one, one of his sons, Ham, sees his nakedness and comes out and we assume that he is disrespectful. And the other two brothers take a cloak and go in backwards, you know, kind of not looking at him and cover their father to cover his nakedness because it was an extremely disrespectful, dishonorable thing uh, to, to uh, see their father in that condition. So throughout the Bible, the problem of drugs or addiction is dealt with by referring to wine, simply because it was the most widely used drug at the time. What the Bible says about addiction. Now, when the Bible talks about addiction, it's talking about drugs and associated problems. So we read in Exodus 20 verse three, and it says in Exodus chapter 20, verse three, you shall have no other gods before me. So I want to kind of explain what this has to do with substance abuse. Addiction is when some idea or substance controls and dominates you. We've already explained that. God tells us that only he has the right to control and dominate you. Only he can be your God. The reason for this, or the reasons for this, are simple. You know why only God can be your God? First of all, God is the creator and he is worthy to be your leader and your God. Drugs, on the other hand, are things. They're part of the earth. A human dominated by God is natural, orderly, good. A human dominated by a thing is not natural and undignified. It's like a dog walking a man on a leash. It's got things in reverse. God wants to lead, when I say you, all of us, but God wants to lead you to a life of happiness and fulfillment and eternal existence. Addictions, on the other hand, lead to pain and death. Always, always, always to pain and many times death. God has the right to lead. God gives you a life and all you have in this life. So he has a right to lead you. 
Addictions give nothing but misery and death. For a time, you know, for a season, there's pleasure for a season, but then comes the pain. So someone will say to me, well, what's the sin? Well, you know, uh, if I take, uh, you know, if I go in my, uh, my brother's uh, house and I steal his TV, and it's called, you know, it's called theft, thou shalt not steal, you know, that's the sin. If I, if I uh, you know, have sex with uh, someone who is not my spouse, uh, well then that's, uh, you know, there's a name for it. that's adultery, that's the sin, that, that action right there is a sin and it's called adultery. But taking drugs and illegal drugs, what is that? What's the sin there? The sin is idolatry. That's the sin. It's the sin of idolatry. You are taking something into yourself that will eventually dominate you. It will become your God. That's the sin. And we are only allowed to have God as our God. Another passage of scripture, Paul says in Romans 12, one and two, therefore I urge you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So the purpose of our lives is to find God and to serve Him and to honor Him with what we say and do. That's, you know, somebody said, I don't know what life is about. Anytime someone says to you, I don't know what life is about, I'm trying to find the meaning of life. Well here, go to Romans 12, one and two, and the meaning of life is right there. What is my life about? My life is about serving God finding out who he is and serving him, knowing him, knowing his will and doing his will. That's what our life is about. The rest is wallpaper. I work at GM, that's wallpaper. I have a house in the city and a house in the country, that's wallpaper. So this means that when people look at our lives, their reaction is that they are motivated to believe in God themselves, or to serve God more than before, or to say to God, you are wonderful. If this is the kind of person that represents you, God, you are wonderful. However, a person who is addicted does not motivate anyone towards God. There is nothing spiritual or godly about someone who is a slave to something. Whatever that is, they smoke, they, 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 whatever they look at, they sniff, they eat, they think, they do to themselves. How many of you would take me seriously about anything that I said? Or how many of you would really make a greater effort to become better Christians if you found out that I secretly was a heroin addict. If one day you went into my office and you, you, know, you came to see me and I wasn't there and I happened to carelessly have left on the counter on the bookcase you know, a, a plate with a needle and all the paraphernalia uh, to take a heroin hit. How, you know, how much respect would you have for what I am uh, preaching and teaching? How many uh, excuse me, the power of my influence rather over you for good is based on my ability to give a good example of freedom from addiction. For starters, of course, preachers are not without sin. Uh, that's absolutely true. But they must not be slaves to sin. I trip over sin, I step into sin, I sometimes willfully go ahead and sin because I'm angry or whatever, but I'm not a slave to sin. I'm not a slave to sin. You ought not to be slaves to sin. We ought not to be slaves to sin. We've been set free. We're in Christ. Then 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 
6, 19 to 20 says, or do you not know how, excuse me, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. You know, people defend their addictions or their experiments uh, with drugs by saying that it's their life. They say, it's my life, it's my body, I'll do you know, what I want with my life and my body, and you can't tell me what to do. However, the Bible says that the body belongs to God, not us. My body doesn't belong to me, it belongs to God. He creates the soul in the body. He allows us to be born and come into being. He provides all that we need uh, to live. He is going to judge us uh, when we die. He will reward or punish us based on how we used our bodies every part of our bodies. My body belongs to him. Drugs cause addiction and addictions cause loss of power, illness, and eventually death. God didn't create our bodies for this kind of usage. Our job is, is to find out what God wants us to do with our bodies and our minds and our talents not to waste our time and bodies on substances and addictions that will eventually ruin them. You see, our bodies are not ours to ruin. I, it's a, you know, off the, off the grid subject, but people who make a, uh, don't even make a living at it, they do it just to show off, but people who risk their lives simply to be featured for a moment or two on Facebook or in a magazine or something like that, or to sell soap, or to sell mascara, or some other product. You have people who risk their lives, jump out of planes, do all kinds of things where they actually risk their lives. They risk their bodies. It's not what the body is created for. So if someone says, what does the Bible say about drugs? In a simple fashion, your answer will be, well, the Bible is against the use of illegal drugs because that's illegal. <laughs> Number one, Romans 13. You know, what does the Bible say about illegal drugs? Well, it says it, it's illegal. So if it's illegal, don't do that, <laughs> no matter what it is. For starters, that should be enough, really, it should. If the law forbids it of the land, as a Christian, it's an easy decision for me. But the Bible is against the use of illegal or legal drugs in the wrong way because they lead to addiction. Paul says in Romans 9, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Disqualified from what? Disqualified from the prize that we all are aspiring to, which is what? Which is eternal life. I don't want to be disqualified from that race. And what's the problem? Well, he says it right there. I make my body my slave. I make it do what I want it to do. I do not turn over the control of my body to a substance, to a thing, to another person. I'm in control of my body for the glory of God. One more. The Bible warns us against becoming addicted to anything because, as I said, it replaces God in the number one position in our lives, and this is simply idolatry. Two, addictive behavior does not honor God and it pushes people away from God. 
if you are a Christian and you are addicted, you're not usually interested in coming to church. And three, addiction uses the body for short-term pleasure that leads to sickness and death. God did not intend the body to be used in this way. So there's no place in the Bible where you're going to find a command that says, thou shalt not use any addictive substance. I mean, be nice, but it doesn't say that anywhere. If there were, we could not in good conscience drink coffee or eat chocolate because these things have caffeine and caffeine has a mild addictive uh, ingredient in it. Rather, the Bible warns against the dangers of addiction. It calls it drunkenness. The addiction that comes from abuse as well as illegal activity and acti activity that leads to addiction. Science proves uh, how destructive it is, addictions, and how easy it is to go from experimentation to addiction and destruction. It's so easy, just like that. And so the Bible warns against behavior that will lead to addiction and why this will cause us to lose our souls. Like I said, someone who's addicted to drugs is rarely interested in participating in worshiping God because he's already got a God that he's worshiping. Why should he come here and worship you know, another God? All right. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll cut it off there. And uh, one, more, one more thing, one more kind of lesson on this topic. And this time I'm going to be really focused and that is the sobering truth about alcohol. Why? Because alcohol is not illegal. Alcohol is legal. It's an addictive substance that's legal. Uh, and more than legal, it's also promoted in our society. So we're going to talk about that next week. And then after that, we have other topics other than addiction, other topics that we'll be covering to finish out the entire series. All right, that's our lesson. Uh, for, uh, for this time, I appreciate your attendance, thank you.